what will T1 go for? Expectations are jungle right now, but Monar has already demonstrated that he has a very deep champion pool and he's quite happy to pick whatever they want. I think there's room for something like a Trundle to be good here, if, especially if they want a little bit more early game agency, but it does very well into the Viego matchup, depending on... Nope, okay, they're instead right. just gonna pick Faker's Rise. They wanna make sure that he has that comfort and the ability to roam and attack these side lanes. I love it. When we get these lore picks <laughs> in eSports, Faker with literal movies made about him on the champion. Blind picks it, says Yagao, what is your move, my friend? And let me remind you, this meta right now, the majority of mid laners are saying, there's like two, two matchups you can pick Rise into anymore. This is not a widespread thing. This is Faker specific. This is GOAT specific. And then you can double protection ban it against Yagao with the map mobility champions. The two preferential ones, the Talia and the Galia. So a few things uh, I've spotted. The first is that T1 have decided to mitigate any roaming matching that Yagao typically goes for. This does make me question if he's thinking about a twisted fate. This was something that he often fought, fell back on if he wants to make sure that he can attack these side oh. lanes. The other thing that I noticed is this. Jace ban yep. does suggest to me that they're looking at a Fiora top line for 369. T1 are saying we can play the entire map on Summoner's Rift, and you cannot, JDG. <laughs> you cannot catch up with us. Vedius, glad to be here with a Nocturne pick, even though it's not <laughs> mid lane with you, because being able to turn off the lights, you saw what T1 were able to do, pulling JDG across the map in the previous game. Now you can deny teleports even with the early Nocturne ultimate and rise plays from Faker. He obviously still has it with the Realm Warps. JDG though, they stick to comfort. They got the Viego already for 369. Throw or throw the Renekton uh, for 369 there, as well as the Viego for Kanabi. So the Renekton does make a lot of sense in terms of being a safe blind. There aren't many things that Zayas could pick that would give him a winning matchup, but he doesn't need a winning matchup. We know how versatile of a player he is, and Kerry is just Ooh. flexing through all the different champions that he could pick as an option. I actually loved the hover of the Gangplank the most because it gives them another global to work I with. Agree. I agree. And I have confidence in, in Zeus as far as the carry play. Yeah, even though that was just a hover early, that is my preferred matchup into Ren Ren Renekton. Have confidence in Zeus to avoid letting 369 stack a big enough wave to dive him on. Oh, 369 really? is a solo kill specialist. As we said, coming into this game, he has the highest solo kills of anyone in the tournament at seven. Now, though, against Zeus, can you do it? Gangplank, if you stack a wave versus him, maybe they could bring Kanavi and go for the kill, but you're going to have to coordinate. The thing that I love about T1's approach to the draft in this series is they recognize, as the world does, that JDG have gotten this far because of their team fighting, their objective yes. setup, their control around the map is what makes them world class. So T1 said, you know what? How do you fare in 1v1, 2v2, and side lanes? And this is an area where GDG have not consistently been tested, whereas T1 is more than happy to play that style. With Zayas and Faker playing at their prime, it is an advantage. I see it all the same. We know Zayas is an incredible player. Owner, we'll see how much he's able to play around the Renekton. The gank power not huge up there. But I want to know what he does other than rush level six. And Zez has started with Corrupting Potion here uh, for himself on the Gangplank. So you can be very, very aggressive in early lane phase, spamming out your Qs with your Corrupting Potion ticking to get a lot of strong trades. But the real crux will be, can he get enough money for his Sheen back uh, with that investment? Well, Prime Gaming has given away 150,000 RP to several lucky fans every single day of Worlds. Head over to PrimeGamingWorlds22.com to enter and make sure to put in today's secret code to get bonus entries. Run from it, hide from it. It will find you all the same. The TSM chance have made their way. In every city, which I am very happy about. <laughs> it is so much fun to be back here casting in front of a, a 20,000 person arena. Do you want to sound like 20,000 people right now? The Thank you. The energy is electric here in Atlanta, Georgia. Let's see if we can keep that energy up as we move into game three. So we're looking at the early game, the early pathing owner going to start on the Raptors. Nocturne's early clear through these multiple mob camps is very fast, very efficient, and he's likely going to convert that into the red, and then perhaps do a full clear topside or path towards his bot. 
Yeah, I definitely expect a full, a full clear from him. Should be noted that during 369, uh, base tanking the barrel tri brush play here from Zeus, he was able to get his ward there down onto the Krugs. So they'll have that timer on the Nocturne full clear. And it is also worth noting, you don't just go from Raptors to red uh, for your full clear for Nocturne. He's trying to get all these smaller camps down yep. and respawning quicker um, by going to Krugs first, but then picking up red buff. It's a hyper efficient path, right? Because as you rightly said, it gets this respawn timer going much quicker, but also what's crucial is he's doing a full clear from top side into the bot lane. The person we also have to keep our eyes on is Kanavi. Often what he's done is full clear on one side of the map into a mid lane gank. We've seen that two times in a row, and we've seen Faker burn some type of summoner, whether it be Ghost or Flash, or basically pressure being put onto Faker in mid lane. This ward, though, that you just highlighted for me, Kobe, covers for that. T1 have adapted, and they've recognized that this is a consistent play that Kanavi looks to make, so they're mitigating any early pressure to give Faker a little bit more safety in the 1v1. One more poke in the bottom side, temporary 3 CS lead here for Goomis. He's shoving that one down, obviously. Nocturne has rushed down to his bottom side now, gets his own blue buff at level 3. And then can kind of path back up. We'll see which way he goes long turn. Yagao makes like he's putting a ward down. Looks like he actually doesn't go for it, but makes the move to say, I've warded the invade, you know. And actually finally does put it down. So uh, we'll see if Nocturne comes through, or if he goes for a gank through. Obviously he wants to go behind. It's hard to gank his ear from the front. And it's far enough back that the controller doesn't see it. Actually pretty important. To get the positioning right away from a control ward, Kanavi has skipped one camp and is up topside. This is what I was talking about for playing against Gangplank. Stack a wave and go for the dive early. That's your opening. Here we go. Wants to find the stun at the right time. Oh. Let's the W go down. Puts all the attacks down at one time. Zeus just going to let him drop the aggro for the health parts down to 100. He can't clear his wave very fast. The, the turret's been reset. Second stun comes across. First blood claim. Kanavi will have to flash to drop aggro. They did it. They execute on the stack wave and dive versus Gangplank. The class for Renekton matchup here into it. I will say as well for that early W, Kanavi was trying to predict the flash. Even though it looks kind of weird there, Zeus holds onto his flash, he saves the summoner spell, still goes down, and is able to teleport right back, so at least he doesn't lose that many minions. And crucially, he got 11 CS and Futures Market, meaning he could afford Sheen on the recall. Yeah. That is so important has the Gangplank and he has the item he needs to play his lane out. That was our exact question for him. Yeah. So big stuff there, even though going oh. down. So JDG with that first blood money, repeat from Kanavi as the wave has bounced back. And Nocturne's here. Now Renekton, I mean, it's Pickaxe versus Sheen. They're actually both relatively powerful here. Gets away from the barrels, gets the passive back. And the bait, the trap has been set. Zay is going to be hit. Eats the orange, stays up for now. Order wants a bit more, but he's waiting out. Spills it nothing. The flash in. Zay is the flash follow. It's a one for one. But can Renekton win against Nocturne? The big stun. And three, six, nine is good for a three, one. No teleport on Zeus. Look at this minion wave. 369, he's so, so satisfied. Can keep the minion wave there. Zeus is gonna have to walk all the way back. Here it is, Kanavi. Such a big brain counter gank here. And then when Owner and Zeus try and flash forward to finish off the kill on him, they get the answer. And 369 can finish off the second kill as well with all the rage he had stacked up on the Renekton. The initial problem with that play for 369 was that his abilities were on cooldown. Just before that play happened, he invested everything onto getting a short trade against Zayas, oh. which made it awkward. So Kanavi getting that initial exchange onto Zayas was really smart because it just bought 369 that extra bit of time. But it also gave the JDG top jungle an opportunity to get revenge after they got hard outplayed last game. Yeah, 369 has an ulti. What's the stun gonna look like is the question. Nocturne's nearby. Conqueror is stacked up. Oh no, owner's here. Just kidding. We got our own jungler. The fear lands. Kanavi's gonna get one. And it's time to be afraid. In the bot side, it's hope. Extinguishing it from T1. Gets the root. The flash from Faker. Missing. Hit with the bubble. Carry a dozen. And Faker gonna try to find the rest. Missing. E Auto gets a single. It's two for two as Faker cleans it up. Oh my god, more action! Oh, he missed! Yes. He missed! He missed the ulti! Zayus sidesteps it and turns one back. 11 kills, six minutes into the game. We promised you a bloodbath, and in the arena, both teams are delivering. Inject five games of this right into my veins. My goodness, they are so aggressive going for that dive. 
by Konami here right into the face of Zeus, and he stands tall, Q right in front of him, gets the kill, plus gets that minion wave. That was so critical. You know what Konami was thinking? He was thinking, if I could kill him here, this Gangplank is out of the game. Losing another giant stacked wave would be just devastating, and yet he pulls it out. Both dives. Let's take a look at the back at the beginning before all the craziness. So 369, he gets level six and he's committed to getting this kill. Doesn't quite have the stun up yet. Not sure where that was available, but you're gonna see him use it just now as the Nocturne Snow Shield gets broken by the Q into the stun. But it's enough damage for Kanabi to get that conversion and then go for a commitment onto Zayas. He's so low in the top lane. Oh, oh the but orange then heal, and he realizes Kanabi, if he stays underneath that tower, it's gonna be a one for one. We didn't get to see the 2v2 kill in bot lane Owner as we get back into action. Well, they're going to have ultis, but there's no fight to be had. The CC not really there to be landed. Of course, missing without much available on his kit. Ulti not there just yet. Barely level 5 for Karia, so far from Tidal Wave. Just going to be there to clear out the wave and let it shove in. So you can see, once again, Kanavi covering for his laners. This is something that he's consistently done throughout the series to make sure that they can get this push underneath the tower to either allow him to invade, get deep vision, or to allow the laners to reset and spend that gold. Right now, they're contesting that bot side, River Vision. He will be able to secure that crab. And T1 will just be forced to watch. Now, as we move forward, what is this bottom lane gonna mean? It means Nocturne is in the lane! And it's hope has died! Missing a bit low, but not enough damage to kill him under the turret. Exactly! We can't even get our words out. As it's so action-packed here. T1 strategy though, remember all the globals drafted to play around this bottom lane. The first pick, Lucian Nami, rewarded again. This is now a two-kill Faker Rise in mid lane that can roam down there. Plus the Nocturne Ultimate, just used by Owner, will secure not only turret plates for Guma and Karia, but also the Dragon stacking starts now. And I think that that was really crucial for T1 because Dying in the two versus two from JDG was not a great position for the Lushinami to be in. We've seen Gumayushi do this before, but he's able to bounce back as he demonstrated last game. But the fact that Faker and Ona can consistently roam towards the bot side of the map and just make sure that T1's duo stays ahead is something that Yikao just can't match on the Azir. Exactly. No lane is safe now. T1, with their draft, investing so heavily into Globals. Zayus is going to be pushed off a little bit more of this top lane presence. Just getting him off the XP, but the same thing, of course, was happening to the JDG bottom side. Faker goes back to mid to play his own wave. And Kanavi's just going to take away the Krugs, as you can see, 369. Gets his second plate, and the Q is going to land at the right time. Kanavi autos it a bit too early, gets it low, and Parley takes the lion's share of the XP away from Kanavi. The gold, though, is mostly on the small ones. But now this turret dies to a simple Herald charge. If they want it on Hope, they can lane swap, get him topside, and summon the Herald for him. It's one of the reasons why Zeus is so hyped up as this young top lane prodigy. Not just because of the pop-off moments, because of the big carry games, but also his ability to play on the weak side here, giving up the extra wave, still staying calm, going in, last hitting with the Q on the attempted jungle, uh, counter jungle there as well for himself. And even though he's significantly behind NCS with all the top lane focus, his ult is ready and enables T1 to make that cross map play now. He certainly is. We'll see where he chooses to invest it. Right now, both supports have made their way back out onto the map. Come on, Mastercard. In the first two games, went deathless. So far in this game, he was killed, but by missing, which is quite ironic that the only person that can kill him before 15 minutes is another support. Uh, but T1 dead even right now with JDG with a slight gold lead. Faker has to be careful, though. The ultimate is available for Yegao. He chooses not to commit those. They don't know it, but they're wary of Ona and his ability to very quickly join the fight. Yeah, I, I, they're just itching to use this global composition. Gangplank ultimate ready, Nocturne ultimate ready, Faker as well afterwards with the Realm Warp. If they first get the kill, then he can Realm Warp the minions forward to help push on towers, and they're going now. Big damage down to the turret, down to two plates itself, as Pope will be able to clear the wave out, but it forces that TP from Yagao, and it means T1 gets to push down mid lane first. Maybe Faker can come out of plate down to this mid lane. Much like last game, T1 with all the advantages in the questions that they can pose to JDG. Hey, what will you do if we force on bottom lane? Well, you have to teleport. Now you've got this giant long cooldown. You can't get right back to mid. They just push the mid lane in. They will take the teleport cooldown advantage and not force the dive there. Just use the cooldowns elsewhere. I like the way that you describe that. It's T1. Oh, hang on, ult. Nocturne is here. Wait for the double dash. Oh. Flashes on both of them. Is it going to be over the gangplank ulti? 369 runs away. Flash for flash. Two for one on ultimates. 369 barely lives. Has zone TP to get back to lane. The 
the play was great from uh -oh. Mona. You flash commit to make sure that the tether stays in range of the champion look you're looking to fear. Unfortunately, Zayas just couldn't quite get in range to deal that extra bit of damage to get the kill. Big heal actually 140 back on that one. It's gonna be getting a bit low, but he's not in range of hard CC and helps the wave get cleared. Gets his own fast recall because of the Herald and inventory, but timer down below one minute has to make his way to a lane soon. I want to point out how far forward all these lanes are for T1. Look at this, the tenacious fighting. Bottom lane shoving up in the 2v2. Top lane constantly being matched by owner in the 2v2. Faker as well, mid lane. They, they are not letting JDG move onto this map. T1, they know how to play the early game with high aggression. This is a team that throughout the year has been known for their incredibly dominant early game. And I think that they've demonstrated this World Championship that they know how to transition that lead into quick wins. Most of their games, sub 30 minutes. This is a team that dominates with the early lead, but JDG, they're, they're used to aggression, okay? They're from the LPL, uh, the homeland of aggressive tendencies in the early game, and they are accustomed to weathering that storm. The question is, can they get the fights that they're looking for? And especially in that aggressive homeland, they are the kings of coming back. So it keeps it exciting here. We'll see if they're able to fight their way out of it this time. Well, the money of the turret does go to 369. Gorge Rinker now done. As he, of course, tries to stack his armor against Triple AD, holding the front line with his Gorge Rinker. Has a gold lead, but obviously the scaling so much better on the gangplank area. Looking for any wards that could be put down or swept away. The red buff will be claimed. I think possibly the biggest difference, too, in this game is that this is a game where T1 are going to be the early Dragon stacking team. So Dragon arriving very shortly here. No teleport on Zayas or ultimate from the Gangplank. This is the one that gets a little bit dicey on the timing windows. Of course, your Gangplank ultimate cooldown comes up really quickly. So as long as it doesn't happen right now. Yeah, oh, for all 369 takes the fight. The barrel's going to get hit, though, which means the slow is there. The passive reset. And Zeus wants to be the king of top lane. Barrels it down for a bit, though. Gets his passive back. Flashes in. But it means the stun. Zeus flashes to deliver 300 gold. And we got more, though. The fight isn't done. Tugwit coming across the bottom side. The knockup's going to land. Lulu buys him some time just barely does jd live this is the battle of top lane as we wanted to see 369 struck first zayas bounced back in game two and we saw the isolated 1v1 matchup it was close but zayas oversteps and 369 comes out on top they have them both right now they can both show up for this one can he ult over the wall kanavi is gonna burn that one flashes first nami's there and the kill comes across fakers on a killing spree missing flashes for his life they got the early roam so they can fully commit. Even with Yigao coming to try and close the gap here, T1 getting the early kill on the Kanavi means they will get priority on Dragon. They will get the, the objective despite Zayus. Good trade there from Faker. But wow, I, I mean, every time we see one advantage gained somewhere, the other team gains an advantage elsewhere on the map. And it was just really good awareness from T1 to commit to that bot side of the map play. They're able to collapse much faster compared to JDG, largely because of this is Z in the mid lane. And Faker on the rise once again is first to the play. But let's look back at this 1v1. So Zayas feeling pretty confident with his Trinity Force. But I want On live, I was looking at the cooldown for his ultimate. It was only a few more seconds afterwards. And you can see here he has the option with extra distance. But he flashes in instead without waiting for the for the ultimate, and 369 just rips him a new one. This is 369, Renekton, okay? Known for it. And he gets the last lap. Rift Trail coming up very quickly, though. I pop Smiteable, who's going to claim it was owner before this time around. It does go to JDG. And Kanabe gets the eye. Two drakes to zero. Gold, actually, a 1,000 in T1's favor as well. The top scoreboard says T1 are winning game three. Yagao just farming so far has not found his way into any meaningful team fights. See if the Herald charge can mean a bit more. It is one to one in turrets. Plates were close earlier. 369 able to hold the front line decently well. But get a seal to come back on in. Has his flash soon. Ulti's up now. Could try to find a target. Guma has his cleanse. Of course, Zeus has oranges. Everyone else is the target. So the awkward thing for T1 right now is their waves aren't in a great spot. If you look top, you can see that with no tower, Isaiah's wave will force him to overextend. He is going to go enter it now as Guma Yushi. 
who will be forced to dash out. But the bot lane in the same uh, vein, Faker, can't really be sent into that bot lane, which means that JDG could just force this skirmish in the mid lane. There was room there for JDG to actually commit onto that tower, maybe even force a fight. But they decide, you know what, now that Zeus has pushed out that top wave, we'll go and catch it and we'll look to reset. Yeah, T1 looked to get some breathing room. They sent Faker down to bottom side. This is the only lane where they had already taken the outer tower. So Faker trying to push on bottom, get the minions up to the secondary tower, while the rest of the four squad here puts pressure on mid. The Weavers have cleared away. JDG obviously pretty good scaling on the Aphelios down here, but Guma has always put out so much damage in these fights, moving towards his own rapid fire. Candle later on, missing, gets Australia's done. JDG ever confident in the movement speed. We get three games in a row of Cloud Rift. Let's hear it for Cloud Dragon, baby. Yeah, it's the best one. My pickums are thankful, I will say. <laughs> oh, it actually has been. Three in a row. Yeah. That's crazy. I've been very keen on that one because Cloud Drake was the least killed Drake coming into the series. Oh, that's a big combo coming off of Guma's not gonna die to it. A bit of damage will at the very least delay Guma's back. The Herald will be now dropped mid, opening this up, gives JDG a lot more control and makes it easier to push into the enemy jungle. They've got a ward on him. 369 is seen. Here comes tied away. Here's the rest of it. Flashing on enemies. Nocturne is left alone in the back line. Gonna stay alive. The scoop cut across. It hits two. A flash away from Caria. Somehow Owner is still not dead. Kanavi dives in. And the dive out of the tower. 369 gets one. But it's a one way trip. Faker takes him out. Yeah, that's a dive under tower already. 369 wanted another solo bolo on the Zayas. And he does get it, but that at the cost of his own life. And it means JDG can't then finish out the tower after that little scrap. Nice little opening from Yaga though, as you saw the angle, sweeps in, gets the knockback for the extra kill. Faker holds the line though, 4-0-0 now on the rise. He's just been picking up kill after kill, and he was the benefactor of 369's aggression. I believe he also picked up a shutdown as well. So this mid laner will only continue to get stronger, but let's have a look here. The Herald gets dropped down. Guma gets stunned up, the ultimate to disengage from JDG diving underneath the tower, but then there's no follow-up onto Ono's engage. Then the ultimate from Yagao is good, lands onto two members of T1, they're forced to flash out. Meanwhile, on the back line, 369 is able to get the kill onto Zeus. But look at Faker, locking up Zeus underneath the towers, means that those stacking tower shots will hand the kill over to him. Oh, shut down. Seems that I was incorrect in that statement, but regardless, it ends up being one for two overall, but the tower still stays strong, and T1 hold on to the gold lead. Once again, a black Cleaver 369, he's the build path there. Cold nearly done, so again, building for aggressive as much damage as possible here. As we get, looks like uh, Blade of the Ruin King on the way for Kanabi. So two damage items here on the Viego. The advanced plate can often be pretty common. Yeah, the double Reaker build a bit much. Double click on that one, but not gonna be a problem here. Red gonna be claimed for an invade. Gonna be Yushi and the rest of T1, ensuring the bottom jungle belongs to them. And they want to keep up this dragon stacking. Zeus right now, no ultimate again as it's ticking down with him pushing on top side. Moments before the Drake, if you can get a teleport from Gangling early on and set up your barrels through some of these brush in the fog of war, that can lead to some big explosions. But they're actually valuing just walking Zayus down now. Walking down the river, 12 seconds till it spawns. JDG are the ones who own the path down. Kanavi aggressively looks for any wards, doesn't see any. One gets put down, put out as well, Guma. Forcing a Shirelia is out, 369 cannot find his target, locked in place, needs to ult to stay alive, but he's feared, and he's fallen. Nocturne goes for number two, hope dropped, a flash away from missing, but Faker won't, and he's unstoppable, 11 to 9. You can't, one. You can't touch Guma Yushi. His confidence is insane right in front of 369. Baits him in. Faker's not done. He dodges the stun. Ah, really beautiful stuff right now. Gonna try to stack the Conqueror. Try to find the kill with help from his mid lane. Arizona's buys some time, but they should kill him. The ult's too early. He needs some soldiers back. He finds the army and a thousand gold goes to Kanavi. However, Baron is dying. T1 with an incredible team fight in the mid lane are able to usurp the team fighting powers of JDG. 369. The benefactor of all that early game gold, the big beefy frontline is shut down as T1 dance around him, dance around JDG, and secure themselves the first Baron of game three. I love this play from Gumayushi. He is so confident right now, playing in the face of these melee champions, baiting them in, daring them to try and touch him. Stays just out of arm's length there, and T1, can he get away, away from this, though? Yeah, still has cleanse and flash. Was not even remotely close to dying. 
And then with turret falls, T1, 1350 on the Red Bull Baron power play. Yes, they dropped the Cloud Drake, just means more can be killed. I know, it's a positive, honestly, as we crest into two and three items. Chainsword on the way now for the top laner. Look at this, he dashes in with the ultimate to get some damage here, and then allowing 369, dash forward, he just kites him into the Nami. Karia gets the double knockup. Yeah. Ulti into bubble, right into T1's hands. Karia playing these fights beautifully throughout this series. The chain CC, there was nothing that Renekton could do, and like this is just one of the problems with Renekton. He doesn't have easy access onto the backline unless he's finding a good flank. <laughs> See the smiles on the T1 faces and the frustrations on the side of the JDG. After losing that Baron, this game now becomes lauded away and as Gumiyushi once Ooh. again goes in. Chunks hope to have Tidal Wave, builds a lot of time. Getting away from the fear, but Nocturne dives for more. Owner's gonna get one and stay alive. Gumiyushi is at one hit. Yagao kills him. Owner could go for a bit more. Big damage out of Zeus, finds one. Owner may go too far. He will jump two up and he drops. In the top side, though, a solo kill, 369, once again rolls the dice and takes down Faker, not even burning TP a flash. into the mid lane, he's looking for the collapse, 369. Flash up in five seconds, could find a good target, Karia has nowhere to go, doesn't have his own flash, doesn't have a good way out, Shirelli has to get his target into range. I don't know if he can get the blast plant in time, oh. nicely done by missing, 369 finds the kill. JDG lose two, but they kill four. What? That's right, for it. four dead on the side of T1. I was not expecting the fight to turn that way. T1 felt like they had such firm control over the game. And then just like that, after a bit of aggression from Guma, JDG turned it around. Nine, 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 baby. He gets another solo bolo. Off screen, count it. Teleports in, gets another kill. Trapping Carrier here. And more money for JDG to mount their comeback. Remember that after the last team fight, JDG still got the dragon. They got that objective, so they also stalled T1's objective stacking here. Another uh, bait attempt here from Gumiyushi as they get the counter onto Kanavi and is the ultimate commitment there from Nocturne. Meanwhile, here's our solo we're, we're looking for. Baker just trying to kite away from the Renekton, has the ultimate to try and escape, but the stun then comes through from 369 to mitigate that. Baker doesn't have Flash available to get away, realizes he can't do anything in the 1v1. And then the TP from 369 catches T1 completely unawares. Zeus and Carrier split apart because they realize that they can't come out ahead in this fight. The Shirelius from Missing to help close the gap, and you'll see Missing landing an auto attack on the Blast Pan to deliver the fish to the hungry, hungry crocodile. And you can tell the bloodlust is getting to these players with the high pace of this action. Earlier, owner with the tower dive on that Nocturne, with the rest of his team just a little bit too far away by the by the mid tower, goes down and sets up for that play. Crossing the map though, 369 and Kanavi, great. Scryer's bloom there by Faker, spots going on, his rest of the team already took down the bottom jungle, they're taking down the bottom tier two turret as well, four men strong, they shove this one out. Mid lane out of turret drops though as well. And as Gangplank ult was required to clear out top lane, they're still going for more. Keep in mind, this is four pushing the bottom side. Two turrets taken, JDG sent most of the team back to defend, but the inhibitor is already gone. Really good response once again from T1. We complimented their ability to play through the side lanes in game two. They're uh -oh. demonstrating it here in game three. Beautiful. Kanabi. I'm not going to say that he baited out the ultimate, but that's what ended up happening. Doesn't get caught off guard. Yeah. T1 though in the brush. Can I be patient? He doesn't get the ult off. He just dies. He could have ulted. He just gets killed. And that is the jungler down. T1 with 40 seconds till this Drake comes up. About the same time they find the rest. 369 going to take his fight against Faker. Will it be enough? Does he win round two? He's ignited. He's ever frosted. Oh! And Faker with five health left wins the one on one. Him, though. He's going for the sneaky recall, out of vision. They know he's on the left-hand side, missing. Will not spot him, go into the brush. They see, they, you oh, can the see ball. it. You it can see it, it was in vision. They don't walk over to the wrong board. Baker with the okie doke, complete jukes right here. Oh, you ball. can't see me. That ward's just outside the bush, above above the two players. It actually didn't go in the bush, so they didn't see Faker. So the polymorph couldn't actually come down. Faker gets away on the skin of his teeth, and he walks away the victor. This is why Faker is still on the lineup. With all of these young prodigies being built up by T1, he's still the GOAT. T1 will use that commitment topside as well to be able to pick up Dragon number three. 
One away from the soul. T1 have a 4,000 gold lead, a two Drake lead, an inhibitor lead, and a faker lead here in game three. They'll drop a scuttle. It's not nearly as important as having the best player of all time on your roster. JDG will walk the reward on the way over, and out goes Kanavi. All right, now we have to turn our eyes towards this Baron, and now it's going to be a T1 collapse moving up through the river. Teleport is ready for Gagao, I believe. But look at how T1 are just shepherding JDG into this half of the map. 369 and Kanavi are looking for a pick on the Faker, but he's going to respect it. They have the push in mid. Yagao's forced to go back and answer it. Now they're looking for Faker, though. Going to find the ulti on him. This time he's got no escape tools. Azonius buys time. A huge barrel finds more. One for nothing. And it's time to possess the rise, but he's going to drop too quickly. 369 does what he can. They find the second kill. Over the wall they go. Yagao wants owner. Scoops him in. Finds the kill. Safe so far. Missing gets shot down. Oh, fires. But Goomba she takes down two. Carrier left alone, and he's gonna be left to his own devices now. Guma has to retreat, does not have the health to play it out. When the going gets tough, it's the bot lane of T1 that come up clutch. This bot lane yes, cannot afford to be underestimated. And Guma Yushi, with a phenomenal Lucia performance, Carrier is just wasting their time, buying time for the T1 members to respawn. He will lose his life, but it does not matter. What was an incredible oh, hit by JDG? No, right. not going the base through. is still being attacked. He can't kill him, but he's stopping the recalls. They are losing Nexus turrets right now. At least Ganavi respawns the time. They don't lose too much. He'll get most of the farm. But Gumino but the Baron, up here. They have T how many TVs? They have both TVs up and available. They're just pinging it right now. The question mark pings are coming out from JDG. Is this something Realm that you're trying to force? They're not going to force it right now. Yeah, they are. Yes, they are. They're going to send everyone. 369 sees it, though. Takes a chunk. He's got Yakao nearby. Ulti's up in 15 seconds. And then no Baron's being attacked. But this isn't going to be enough. That everyone got into the pit. Owner can obviously blast plant back in, but honestly, JDG weather the storm. Bot lane inhibitor respawning before too long. There are still super waves coming in. They can collect some of the farm, and 369 can always TP back. What a clutch play there from JDG to actually pick Faker off, knowing he did not have the flash available this time around, could not delay as he did in the last time. And they get him, and they get enough of a health lead in that skirmish as well, so that T1, even with the AoE from the Gangplank coming in, they still lose an extra person on the play. Ward's being put right back up around that Baron. They know they can't let it out of their eyesight for a second. Look at the goal difference between the Oh, that's quite early. Smite will come through for Ona, making sure the T1 have control around this objective. But the AD carry difference is so stark right now. Four items completed for Gumayushi, along with the Dirk. Means that he is... I mean, he was the carry last game. He's been a huge carry for T1 throughout this World Championship. And he is a massive threat that JDG need to find a way to shut down. Baker almost at death cap as well, looking at inventories here. Could have a big, big power spike. And with the inhibitor on bottom side, respawning fairly soon, they can still revert to split pushing with their global advantage. The Baron is going to be started off by T1. Once again, JDG must answer the call. They must walk into... They're doing without Guma. They're, they're letting him show on the waves that they don't know it's dying so quickly, but Baron's going to drop here. Look for the stun, not going to find it. Nocturne turns off the lights, and that's Baron claimed. Near the kill, it's an ult to safety for Kanavi. Cannot be in this fight. Oh, he's gonna die! He's gonna get shut down! The Realm Ward back into the jungle takes down the ADD jungler! They're not done yet! Faker flashes in! Gets the root, gets a bunch of damage. They turn back, he burns a stopwatch, and that's gonna be him oh. fail. The barrel hits two! 369 does what he can, but he's got no team! Burns the stopwatch, immunes the fear, but it's not gonna matter! There's the ace! Zeus! It's a million gigantic barrels! Baker makes the shot call, gets him in and out of the pit, and T1 are going for the base. T1 will wipe JDG off the map. What an incredible team fight, led by Gumayushi. The man has come up clutch once again. He shuts down the core carry of JDG, and they will shut down JDG in game two. Gumayushi may have died, but he kills a hell of a lot more. The Nexus turrets fall. Kanavi's left alone to watch. Once again, his kingdom falls to ruins. T1, two to one. This is the beautiful League of Legends. Watching this T1 team operate.
Kuma Yushi, while the rest of the team does Baron, shows himself for just a second to give JDG a false sense of security, knowing that T1 don't have the 80 carry DPS on Baron, allowing the rest of the team to burn it down under cover of Nocturne Ultimate. Kuma also jumps down Kanabi so low that he goes into the jungle to heal off of Raptors, and then he still wraps around and finds him later. It is insane how much work each member of this T1 squad are putting in right now. And I'm just thinking of the T1 video that they put out yesterday where all the members are talking about it. And Zayu says his goal, you know, in his first year here, 18 year old, is to put the T1 dynasty back where it belongs and Faker back on the throne. It, uh, I watched an interview that Ashley did uh, with Zayus and he says that when I was playing bad, Guma said, look at me, look at me, you can trust me, I, you can rely on me, I will, I will carry you, don't worry about it. And even though Zeus was shut down in this game, he only had to look bot lane at the superstar to know that when the chips yep. were down, he could come up clutch. And still huge in the team fight. So beautifully done, T1 are on match point to